So. <laughs> okay, so welcome everyone um, uh, to the Simons Institute uh, in a manner of speaking. Uh, I'm uh, Shafi Goldwasser, I'm the director of the Institute and I see many, many f familiar faces. I think a lot of you have been to, to Berkeley. I wish you could be here now. It's actually lovely weather, beautiful skies. Um, and we are very fortunate today to uh, have a very interesting workshop, very timely, that uh, Boaz Barak is actually going to, uh, was, is put together and he's going, I'm going to hand it off to him in a minute. I just want to say a few things. As you saw, there's Gather Town, which we gathered uh, before. And uh, I think in some of the breaks, we will go there as well. And other than that, because we are, um, we know each other, and, and I think that it would be a wonderful thing that people want to sort of show themselves they can turn off their um, stop video button and show themselves. And similarly, there's the, I think that Boz maybe will go through instructions more carefully, but there's the usual Q&A and chat. Uh, I think we would love it if people could um, unmute themselves and ask questions informally as well in the spirit of the fact that we are really kind of a tight-knit community. And this occasion is going to be uh, to talk about obfuscation. So I think it's very, um, the, in the breakthroughs of obfuscation of, of, of late, I think it's very appropriate that Boz is going to start off the, the workshop because it's his work that eventually was his thesis um, and, many, and some other co-authors uh, that started the whole question of how to define obfuscation formally and show that it was impossible. So it is kind of a fitting <laughs> that uh, in this workshop, we're actually talking about the fact that it seems like it is possible a, according to a different definition. So I'm gonna hand it off to Boaz and please Boaz uh, introduce the, the, do the real introduction. Yes, thank you, thank you Shafi. Is Boaz still there? Ah, okay. Well, I can't hear anything. I can't hear Boz yet, but I can. So I'll still the time tell you this, the usual thing that you should not bring coffee cups into the yes. lecture room and yes, or food. Yes. And so, since uh, you do it anyway, I, I guess uh, it's futile at this point. Boz. Okay. Um, our videographer is Omid, <laughs> and I think he's on line somewhere and Ashley and Jesse have done a wonderful job here and on staff uh, among us for any problems. Um, we have a problem right now that Boz disappeared. He's fixing his thesis. He's fixing his... <laughs> That's a good point. Well, he had a lot of premonitions there. He had the definition of eye obfuscation which was later defined again in some other form, but uh, actually ah. the comes from there. Maybe we could even revoke his PhD, right? <laughs> we could revoke it, yes. It highlights that the practical aspects of obfuscation are still not worked out. <laughs> but, but you're saying ah. that he's added to the follow-up works <laughs> section. Okay, can, can you guys hear me now? Yes, yes you can. Okay, so... <laughs> Yes, somehow the, there is never um, a Zoom session without uh, di di uh, technical difficulties. And, and so let me uh, not waste more, <laughs> much more of your time. I, I think, uh, yeah, I'm very grateful to the authors of these works uh, that, are, uh, uh, that uh, came here. Um, I think Shafi alluded to uh, obfuscation has been sort of an uh, emotional uh, whirlwind for our community with a, a string of, a, you know, first negative results, then some positive, some, some negative, and some, some candidates, some breaks. And um, this, this is a very loaded term uh, the, the, uh, in this pandemic period, but maybe we are uh, rounding the corner and uh, we see the light at the end of the tunnel with uh, obfuscation based on, uh, on uh, well-founded assumptions and maybe even eventually only, basically only on LWE. And this is uh, in large part to the to the works we'll hear we'll hear about uh, in this workshop. So the other thing is that uh, I I hope this workshop is going to be very interactive. 
So I encourage people that want to participate. Uh, if you're right now listed as a participant in the webinar rather than uh, as a panelist, uh, feel free to raise your Zoom hand and uh, we can uh, promote you to a panelist. Then you can um, um, show your video and we would actually be very, very happy if you do that because um, we'd like to see people's faces and see reactions. Also, uh, please, if you have a question during the talk, you can ask it during chat, but also, and I'll be monitoring the chats, but you can also just unmute yourself at the right point, uh, you know, when there is a natural break and just ask the question. And uh, I, yes, I hope we'll have a very interactive and uh, educational session. And with that, let me uh, pass the baton on to uh, Yael. Or maybe we should uh, wait three minutes so we are uh, according to schedule. So, um, um, yeah, so I'm not going to do uh, tons of introductions uh, in, the, in this workshop. I usually <laughs> don't like uh, very lengthy introductions, but uh, yeah, as, uh, our first speaker will be uh, Yael Kalai, who has worked in many areas of uh, cryptography, uh, obfuscation included, and um, she's um, uh, currently at uh, Microsoft uh, Research New England, and uh, also uh, an adjunct uh, faculty member at uh, MIT. And uh, Yael, maybe you can uh, start by sharing your screen, but we'll wait yes. a few minutes uh, before we, we actually start. And maybe I'll try to, uh, in the meantime, figure out my own connection issues. Does, is, does that work? We don't see, any, see anything yet. Oh, okay. It says you've started screen sharing, but we don't see it. Okay. Yeah, maybe if you haven't uh, tried exiting out and then trying it again. Adam. <laughs> yeah, there's a own technician. So Shafi, what is the current operation of this institute? Like in terms of physical, so we were actually just approved um, a few days ago for something called an outdoor pilot, which is you know we have boards around it and we're putting some more boards around the circumference of the building and people can come and work there, and we are hopeful about an indoor as well. But now there's a lockdown in California, so it's going to start in January fourth. Great. We can see it now, Yale. Okay, good. You can see full screen? Yep. Great. So just please let me know start. if I can start. At 30, please start. Oh, okay, great. So, wow, this is uh, exciting times. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you about uh, kind of the journey that as a community we took uh, towards program obfuscation. Uh, I wanna start by saying that this is by no means a survey. Actually, this is more kind of a personal take on kind of this journey, how I view it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of amazing works that I'm not going to reference. I actually tried to kind of, uh, I'm thinking of this talk also as a stage. Yeah, yeah, you can feel free to uh, start talking. If... I'm talking. You can't hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can hear you also. Okay, good. Yeah, so yeah, it's got some issues. <laughs> Okay, so uh, uh, yes, so uh, I'm thinking of this talk more as a stage for kind of the workshop, uh, kind of to give a perspective. And um, 
First, let me start by saying a huge thank you. Uh, first, for all the you know amazing progress that everyone has made, but also particular thank you for all the people who really helped me uh, prepare this talk. Uh, Shweta, Nir, Tzvika, Rachel, Rafael, Amit, and Vinod, who I you know constantly begged with questions and got answers, and been you guys have been. Uh, Superstar, so thank you. Uh, that was great. I learned a lot from preparing this talk. So, okay, so let, let's begin. And so, you know, program obfuscation uh, has been brought to our community uh, by the paper of Hada and Barak et al, who defined it formally. And, you know, actually, I, I want to say I'm going to present this more as a kind of relating all the work that has been done to kind of what we learned from cryptography in the past. So, okay, so what is the point of program obfuscation? We all know we want to take a program and convert it one that if we look at it, we see nothing. It's unintelligible, but still preserves the functionality. Now, how would we define it? Let's start from the beginning. You know, we're starting. How would we define it? Well, you know, we want to take, let's say, a circuit, models a circuit, that's typical, and we want to obfuscate it. What do we want to uh, preserve? Well, we want to preserve some functionality. We want the obfuscator that generates an obfuscated circuit to be efficient, and we want the obfuscated circuit to be hiding. Okay, what do we mean by hiding? How do we define hiding? Well, you know, we all know how to define, we've been dealing with hiding from the, you know, formal definitions from the 80s, you know, we had the definition of zero knowledge in MPC, who kind of introduced for us the real ideal world definition. So let's take the real ideal world definition here as well. <clears throat> What does it mean that whatever an adversary can do, given an obfuscated program, there's a simulator who can learn the same thing in the ideal world? Okay, what is the ideal world here? Well, he gets input output access, but that's it. Okay, so whatever the adversary can, can learn given an obfuscated program, the simulator can learn given only black box access to the circuit. Okay, so that's natural. However, this notion is noticed by these works, but by the work of Barak et al, is impossible. Now, actually, this should come with no surprise to anybody because it's exactly the same impossibility result that had for zero knowledge. So, you know, the original paper of GMR wanted to do zero knowledge, you know, as classical proofs, but they resorted, they changed the model to interactive proofs to get a posit positive result. They realized that without interaction, it's impossible. Essentially, the same impossibility result holds here. Why? The point is, while the adversary gets something in his hand, which is a succinct description, which the simulator does not, that's essentially what's going on here. That's what makes this notion impossible. Now, actually, this is not as simple as that. The, the work of Bakhetal was very complicated. And the reason is that uh, they restricted uh, the output of the adversary to be a single bit. And once you restrict it to be a single bit, the impossibility result becomes more complicated, but essentially it's still kind of this idea. Okay, but because they restricted a single bit, it turns out that you know, they could only get impossibility for a contrived class of functions. But soon after that, it was noticed that actually, if you allow auxiliary information, which we often do in cryptography, for example, in you know, setting of zero knowledge, then it's actually impossible even for natural classes of functions. Okay, so there's a big impossibility result here. What do we do? Okay, well, there are several options we can take. Option number one is we you know, can they well consider different models, like uh, was done in zero knowledge. So, you know, they consider interactive proofs instead of non-interactive. So this was done actually, we have one-time programs, we have obfuscation with hardware, and there's, you know, probably other models and, and so on. Okay, that's one option, one line, we, you know, direction we took. Another option is let's restrict ourselves to very, very simple functions for which we don't have any negative results, like point function or other subclasses of kind of evasive functions. Okay, there's been a bunch of work in this regime as well. And the third option, which is gonna be the focus of this talk is let's consider weaker definitions. And there were several definitions here, I wrote only two, but the focus of this talk is about indistinguishability obfuscation which is essentially the analog of witness indistinguishability in the context of obfuscation. Mm. Plus, do you have a question? 
Yes, Yael, I, I'm not sure if other participants, but for me, uh, it seems like the, the screen is stuck on the first slide, or, but uh, I'm not sure if uh, uh, what, what's the case for others. Oh, no, the important results. I, I, I think I'm fine. Is there anybody that has the same thing as Boaz? Uh, so then maybe it's just my issue, yes. Okay, no. okay. Mine is not as bad as Boaz, but I'm also a little behind. Like, uh, I feel like you're talking maybe, uh, half a minute ahead of the slides. I, I, I don't think so. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll disconnect and reconnect and uh, it might be just my issue. Okay, anybody else? Uh, does everybody see impossible results on the slide? And does anybody else have this issue? Because if many do, then maybe I should reconnect. No, no, it's fine. No, okay, okay. So, okay, so the notion that work considering that the focus of this work is indistinguishability obfuscation, which is, a, I said, it's the analog of witness indistinguishable proofs. And actually, you know, it's not that surprising that we don't have negative results here, exactly as we have non-interactive WI, why not have, you know, indistinguishability obfuscation? It's very analogous. Okay, so what is the definition of indistinguishability obfuscation? It was, this definition was again in the uh, seminal work uh, was proposed. And it's, it, as I said, then analog the analogy of witness indistinguishability. It just says any two circuits that are equivalent, uh, has, have the same input output behavior, you should not be able to distinguish between obfuscation of one and obfuscation of the other. Okay, exactly as you should not be able to distinguish between a WI proof of one witness and a WI proof of another. Okay, so why is this an interesting up, uh, notion? Well, it was shown uh, by uh, Goldwasser and Rothblum that actually, in some sense, it's the best possible obfuscator. So that's good. You know, if you want something, this is the best you can hope for. And again, analogous to Niwi proof, which is kind of a Niwi proof you can think of as a witness that reveals kind of the minimal amount of information. So it's kind of analogous here too. Uh, of course, it's the let me quantify it as the best possible obfuscation among all obfuscation of a certain size that are slightly smaller than this. So there's a quantification, but essentially it's a great obfuscation. It's the best possible in a sense. However, at that point, which is 2007, it was still not clear to us what, what is it good for. And, you know, we kind of, dis in some sense, I, I felt at least that this notion was a bit dismissed, which is surprising because we should know better. You know, we saw how WI has been so influential you know, this should be too in a sense, but it, we didn't kind of understand it or, or at least, you know, um, talked about it in this way. Okay, so indeed from 2001, from the point this notion was put forth until 2013, we had actually in general for obfuscation, we had no constructions for IO and distinguished obfuscation, no impossibility results, and actually no motivations even. You know, if you look at these papers, they say, well, it's not clear, they don't hide, it's not clear what it's interesting for, you know, we were very skeptical. Uh, and you know, what, one thing that kind of is interesting to me is that, you know, we didn't have any heuristics, even though obfuscators were used in practice. And so usually it's the opposite, you know, usually we have, we're kind of, they're doing things uh, kind of behind us and we're ahead, but this time they were ahead of us. We had no, uh, you know, heuristics. And I remember when I interviewed, it was when I, after my PhD, when I interviewed like Microsoft and IBM, and I asked them, so how do you do it? You know, we have no idea. So what's your, what's your secret? And I got very interesting answers like, well, you know, we remove the comments, we rename variables, we add junk code. So they really did it in a very, very kind of, um, I don't know, basic way. They also didn't have very sophisticated tools. Okay, so this all was the case until the breakthrough result of 2013 by Gag, Gentry, Halevi, Rykova, Sahai, and Waters, who gave the first candidate construction of obfuscation. Okay, and of course they called it candidate construction of indistinguishability obfuscation because of course we know VBB doesn't exist. So, you know, it's a candidate for indistinguishability obfuscation. Okay, and soon after this candidate was put forth, all the uh, Sahai Waters came up with a beautiful puncturing technique that shows that IO is actually very useful. And this brought up to this kind of land of apostopia. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for the slide, uh, which uh, says that, wow, if you, we have IO, we have all these amazing things. Crypto world is beautiful. Okay, all these amazing 
amazing primitives. So now, though, the only question remains, do we actually have it or not? Because the original construction, the candidate construction, did not come with a proof. So it was a heuristic, and it was not clear whether this heuristic is indeed secure or not. By the way, please, please stop me with questions at any point, of course, as Buzz said. OK, so I want to talk a little, about, a little bit about this first IO heuristic, but I'm going to I'm not sure I'm, I'm uh, going to explain it in a way that is really truthful to the paper. I'm going to more explain it in the way I view the intentions of that paper. So, uh, and maybe from a perspective of several years later. So here's kind of the, the, their idea, I think. You know, the first observation is, look, FHE, fully homomorphic encryption, is actually a great obfuscator. It hides everything. But unfortunately, it also hides the output. So that's not good. But then the, the idea is, well, all we need is to obfuscate the decryption function in some sense. So we can do an FHE and we just need a decryption of, of uh, an obfuscation of the decryption functions. Now, this is a bit oversimplified because if I just give you uh, obfuscation of the decryption, you'll just decrypt the circuit C that I encrypted for you. It won't hide. But for simplicity now, let's think, I suppose I give you a decryption function that only decrypts for you valid ciphertext that we're computing by evaluated this circuit C, just as a simplification. Now, the next observation was, well, if this decryption was degree two, then actually we can get the output in the clear. And the reason we can get the output in the clear is the following. Well, if it was a degree two over uh, uh, w when the computation is over a module a large prime p, and the secret key was random in zp uh, to the n, let's say, and then what we could do is we can take a bilinear, a, a, gra a, a group with bilinear maps, and give you as an obfuscation g to the power of the secret key. So g to the uh, sk1, sk2, up to skn. And because we have pairings, you know, we can do degree two. Uh, uh, computation in the, in the exponent, and we can test zero. That's kind of the idea. The idea is we can zero test, so we can check degree two functions. We can check if the output is decrypted to zero or not. So that's great. But of course, decryption functions are not degree two. Uh, they're actually high degree. And so the idea was, you know, we don't have, uh, you know, we can't use bilinear map. Let's use multilinear maps. So what is a multilinear map? Is It's the same thing as a bilinear, but <laughs> Multi, so it takes uh, groups G1 up to Gn and takes G1 to the X1 up to Gn to the Xn to uh, a, a, an element in, the, in, the, in some target group E to the G1 up to Gn to the power of the mul multiplication of the Xi's. So it's just an uh, analogous of, uh, to bilinear maps. It's an extension. So, so, uh, so that's the idea. But of course, this simple outline doesn't work for many reasons. And in particular, the, if you do it this way, the decryption uh, function does not just require multilinear maps that are good for polynomial degree. You'll need exponential degree. So that doesn't work. And so their actual construction is more complicated. They actually go through Barrington's theorem, and they need to use kind of the re-randomization technique of, of Killian to hide things. And, and so things are more complicated. But I think. In my opinion, the high level, kind of the simplified version is this. Okay, so one thing I wanna point out, yes? That, that's a very cool way to, to look at it. I've not seen it before. I wonder, uh, are there actually encryptions where the degree is, uh, where you could kind of use this, at least for heuristic the, directly, where the degree is not uh, exponential, but polynomial? I, I, so I'm not sure, I don't think so. Because I think if the degree was polynomial, it would be essentially an evasive function. It will correspond to an evasive function. Because if a degree is polynomial, it has only polynomially many non-zero uh, elements. So it's, it's uh, a, 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 a polynomially many zeros. Uh, so I think. It's a multilinear map, right? So it's, it has many variables, right? It has n variables, but could be low degree. Right, could even be multilinear, right. but I, right. I still don't know a good way of, of doing it, though. But, yeah. mm -hmm. 
What did you think of the GGH uh, SW construction itself as providing such an encryption scheme where the decryption is via Barrington and Killian? Yeah, that's via Barrington yeah. and Killian. You could think of that encryption scheme. Yeah. Okay. No, but that's that's a nice way to encapsulate it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so then the, so one thing I want to point out, it seemed, you know, when, uh, you know, that, oh, degree two, it's impossible, you can't have a, de a decryption of degree two, but actually, surprisingly, the, you know, breakthrough result that we're going to see today by uh, Ayush, uh, Rachel, and, and Amit actually does go through this route. They don't quite achieve degree two, because that, but they do this degree 2.5, which they'll talk about. So actually, this kind of route did actually uh, span out pretty well, but that was later. Uh, you know, in the beginning, we said, okay, clearly we need multilinear maps. And now the question is, where the hell do we get these? And then there started a quest to, you know, get heuristics of multilinear maps. Was there a question? Yeah, so j just wanted to point out, I think that the combination of low degree and uh, huge modules, that's, that's the hard part, right? I mean, if exactly. the modules was very small, smaller than the degree, then you could get like the degree two things are, are hard over the binary field or, or small fields. So I, Precisely, I think that's exactly the issue. The fact that the modulus P needs to be huge and the, the, the gap between the degree and the modulus, I think is the issue. And, and maybe we can also mention that uh, just in terms of history, uh, the multilinear maps came first and the uh, IR heuristic after. Exactly. So uh, that's exactly, that's my next point. Yes. So actually the, uh, the multi, the, they were already in 2012 by Gang, Gentry, Halevi, they gave the first heuristic construction of not the perfect multilinear map that I showed, but a noisy version of that. And a version of this was used by this first IO heuristic. Uh, okay. So, so, you know, th there was this idea of using multilinear maps. There's been a lot of work on it from 2013 till today. And here's my view on, on where we are. So first, even today, we don't have any clean multilinear map except for degree two bilinear, that's first. Now, in terms of noisy ones, we have a bunch, uh, but all of them seem to have very serious breaks. And, you know, the history was, okay, there's a, a break and then the, it breaks the construction. So there's another construction and then there's a, another break to the multilinear map and then, so then which causes a break to the IO construction and another. And there's been kind of a bunch of constructions. Uh, by the way, all these breaks are some form of linearization attacks. And at the end, I think there's only couple works, I think these two works, uh, that are not known to be broken. They're using uh, what's called a weak uh, multilinear maps. Now, I wish I can tell you more about them, but as soon as I try to look at it, I realize it's really complicated and my kind of instinct was just to run away. So I'm not gonna tell you more about these, but, uh, but the point is these are not broken, at least not yet. We don't know that they're broken. Okay. So where are we so far? So here's the, you know, is the state of the art. We had candidate constructions, which is wonderful. Actually, we could partic par partition them to kind of groups. They were the first generation that relied on multilinear maps of high degree, polynomial degree. And then there was an effort to reduce, reduce, reduce the degree. The second generation were the constant degree, relied needed constant degree multilinear maps. But all of these use this messy cryptographic assumption of kind of use noisy multilinear maps. And I personally find it very messy and I need a cleaner you know, world. <laughs> but then there was the third generation and, and the, oh. I, I think it's probably worth mentioning to people who were not part of these papers that the degree of the multilinear map had something to do with the complexity of the program. So that this is a big jump from generation one to two. Yes, yes, so, uh, yeah, yes, exactly. I mean, yes, uh, right. So the generation uh, uh, two kind of got rid of, uh, uh, they, they kind of managed to talk, they realized, I'm gonna get to it, that all you need to do is essentially consider NC0 uh, uh, computations, which are constant degree. So there is a, a jump there, uh, yes. And then, uh, thank you, Shafi. By the way, please uh, st uh, stop me and feel free to inject, you know, perspectives here, okay? Because the point is, uh, uh, you know, for the community to learn about it and if you have anything that, to uh, add, please do. 
uh, uh, okay, then the third generation actually went back. They realized, oh, okay, you know, the multilinear maps are messy. Let's try to go back and use uh, bilinear maps. And, uh, but, and, and so, so th these use kind, of, these are the new ones, as you see 2019 up to 20, but even these, the state of the art was that they're not, so even these are not under standard assumptions. Um, and they were constantly, the state of the art was there's an attack and a fix and an attack and a fix. And it was kind of, um, I don't know, between a comedy and a tragedy. So a, like I remember once I was in a PC of, of a stock or Fox was it, and there were a bunch of papers that did all these amazing things under IO. It was right after the beautiful paper of uh, Sahain Waters who, proposed the puncturing technique. And it was like these beautiful works that use these, this technique to get all these amazing cryptography, all these ama amazing uh, uh, notions. And we were in the committee and we were like, but do IO exist? Yes, next day, no. Next day, yes, next day, no. And I remember the, you know, at some point the people, you know, the, outside, the cryptographers from the outside were like, is this a joke? Yesterday they didn't exist, today they do exist. <laughs> like, yeah, well, they fixed, you know, but it was really a funny, uh, <laughs> A, a bit frustrating, I'm sure, for the people who actually had their schemes, uh, you know, broken, fixed. It was, uh, you know, a uh, roller coaster. Uh, and I it's think it's a learning well, experience. I just really want to interject. This is, you know, uh, it was a great learning experience. Every attack gave us new insight into like, what was needed. So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, actually, uh, Amit, I want to elaborate on that, uh, which is I think we learned a lot of lessons from this journey. And one of the lessons is that actually, um, you know, relying on maybe uh, having weaknesses in your scheme or breaks or it's not a bad thing. It still moves science forward. The question is, are there good ideas there? And all these things kind of, you know, I, I, my opinion of, of this journey is that it's actually, uh, it's, a, it's a journey of the community. And the, you know uh, who put the, the final stone is is uh, you know it, it's it, that's not the point. The point is each kind of everyone kind of put a brick, and each idea led led to the other. And I think it's kind of beautiful to see kind of how how things how uh, this effort uh, uh, evolved. Uh, but I agree completely. Yeah, I also like to interject. I think one of the main reasons why I think in generation three possibly we made progress is that. Uh, we, uh, at least there was a very clear notion of uh, what it means to break. So uh, when the standard was, uh, here is a heuristic IO construction, takes it as a whole, and as long as you don't break IO fully, you have not made any progress, it's very hard to make scientific progress. Uh, when you say, okay, I have reduced IO to uh, four discrete assumptions, and here is the one magical one where I need the pseudo-random generators of a very particular uh, type, you, you actually, uh, the assumption is well specified enough so people can break it and now you can make progress. And, and I think this is a lesson we learned a lot of the time in, in cryptography that we, when we want to make, a, if we want this attack fix uh, type of a cycle to get us forward rather than running in circles, we really want precise definitions and precise meaning of what it means to be broken. Completely, completely agree. Uh... Yeah, so, so after this, I felt like, uh, at least for me, uh, I felt like, okay, I need to run away from this. This is, so, <laughs> you know, it's, this is really crazy. Uh, but what I wanna show you in this uh, talk is actually, it's not as messy and uh, scary and, uh, as it seems. And I wanna show you kind of how as a community, there was an effort, a really beautiful effort to reduce, you know, the problem of IO, which seems very difficult to easier and easier problems. And the new uh, beautiful result that we're gonna hear about today use this progress. So in particular, the first thing that was observed is actually to construct IO, it suffices to construct functional encryption, succinct functional encryption with sub-exponential security. That was the first observation by Anant and Jane and Bitansky and Vaikuntanathan. Then it was observed by Lin, Pa, Seth and Telang that actually you don't need full succinctness of the FE. It's enough to have semi-succinctness, and I'll explain what that is, if you're also willing to assume LWE. And then it was, this, and then it was noticed, actually, you don't need full FE. All you need is for NC0. So for constant, um, a, for, for um, 
for NC0, assuming you have also PRG for NC0. Great. Then it was, was uh, shown, actually, even that you, all you need is this XIO, which I'll explain, a sub-exponential version of it. And very, very recently, this year it was shown, it was actually um, formalized in an even simpler way by the means of functional encoding. And what we're going to see in this workshop is the first, uh, today we're going to see the result of uh, Jane, Lin, and Sahai, uh, Ayush, Rachel, and Amit, who are going to show how, they, how to construct this semi-succinct FE uh, for NC0 from well-founded assumptions, uh, uh, what I think is actually pretty standard assumptions. And tomorrow, we're going to see uh, the works. Actually, there's two works of uh, Brakelsky, Tal, and Gay Pass in uh, Wien Wicks that show how to construct uh, IO, uh, how to construct this functional encoding, and then get IO this way. Uh, and uh, yeah, the functional encoding is kind of a new, these kind of the things we're going to see tomorrow are new. They're not under like well-established assumptions yet, in my opinion, but it's a very, very excited, exciting line of work that I, I really think they're going to, you know, I'm optimistic that they'll be able to uh, improve on it and, and get uh, better, um, better assumptions. So it, I find it very exciting. Okay, so let me start. That. So that's my plan for today to kind of show you this, uh, a, this re these reductions. I think they're based on very interesting ideas. So any questions before I start? No. Okay, so one thing I want to point out that these reductions are actually based on ideas that we all knew in cryptography already. It's really interesting to see how, how it evolved. So <clears throat> this, this line of work, the main thing it shows us is that all we need in order to get IO is some form of compression. That's the bottom line. If we can compress a little bit, we're good. And at, at first, this is pretty obvious. I mean, in some level, why? Look, we know that, you know, garbled circuits, for example, is a great obfuscator, but it's only for a single computation. So if you know the circuit, you know one input, a garbled circuit hides everything. That's great. But it's just one computation. What IO does is it essentially needs to protect not just one computation, but exponentially many, like for all the possible inputs. And it needs to do it kind of in a compressing way. I mean, you can, you know, send exponentially many garbled circuits, that'd be good, but it's too much, of course. So, um, so we, need to, we need to go kind of from protecting a single computation to protecting exponentially many computations. Now, if we just think about this for a second, it's pretty clear that, wait, this was done before. This is exactly what GGM did, right? What is pseudo random function? It says, well, you know, we can generate a little bit of randomness. How do we generate exponentially many randomness? Using PRG, using PRF, pseudo random functions. This is, a, this kind of seems very, very similar. And indeed this was the idea behind going from succinct functional encryption to IO. It's exactly kind of using the GGM idea. So let me just recall or say what a functional encryption is. So uh, a functional encryption is a semantically, we'll talk about for now public key functional encryption. So it's a semantically secure, semantic secure encryption such that for any function, we can generate a function key. So given the secret key of the encryption and given a function, let's say from L bits to M bits, we can efficiently generate a secret key sub f, a secret key from this f. And what the secret key allows us to do is it essentially breaks a little bit in a very specific way, the, the semantic security. What it allows us to do is given an encryption of x and secret key of f, it allows us to compute f of x in the clear efficiently. But that's all. So, uh, so more specifically, the succinctness requirement first is that the runtime and the output length of the encryption, it can actually depend on the number of output bits of F, but in a, a little bit of shrinking way. So it should be at most, let's say, n to the one minus epsilon for any constant epsilon you want. Okay. So, so the first, so again, we have one fixed F that outputs m bits. 
We allow the encryption to depend on M, but needs to be sublinear in M. So the runtime and the output length of the encryption needs to be sublinear, uh, M to the one minus epsilon. And the security says, well, there are many, many variants, but the one that's relevant here, it says that if you're given a function key, secret key sub F, then still semantically, semantic security holds. So you can't distinguish between encryption of X and encryption of X prime, so long as F of X is equal to F of X prime. So of course you learn f of x, but that's the only thing you learn. Other than that, they're indistinguishable. Okay. So, okay. So uh, just one point is actually if the succinctness was a little less succinct and we allow, let's say the encryption to output m bits instead of m to the one minus epsilon, we, we have that under LWE. Okay, and that's from joint work with uh, Goldwasser, uh, 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 the Popa, Bekuntanathan, and Zeldovich. So it seems like what we have from LWE, so all we need is like this tiny epsilon there to, to get it uh, to, to imply IO. That's what I'm going to show you why it implies IO. And, and now it's, it's interesting kind of to think so is it, is it close to LWE or is it close to IO? You know, is it, what's going on here? And actually, it was interesting. I looked at the paper of uh, Bitanskin by Kuntanatan, and it was interesting to see how we thought back then. So I think, uh, so let me just quote uh, what, what they said. So it is rather tempting to be pessimistic and to interpret our result as a lower bound, showing the improving functional encryption based on standard assumptions may be very hard or perhaps straight out impossible. Our take on the result is quite optimistic. We hope that the construction would eventually lead to I.O. for more standard assumptions, which it indeed uh, did at the end. But it, it's interesting to see how we were so pessimistic about I.O. At, at the time. Um, and one thing I want to point out is F.E. seems indeed significantly weaker than I.O. And the reason that it's significantly weaker, in my opinion, is that for, to construct I.O., in some sense, you need to inject kind of randomness in one shot and protect exponentially many computations in one shot. Whereas in FE, you can inject randomness kind of for each computation. Like for every encryption of X, you inject more randomness. So it seems much, much uh, easier. Um, yeah, and let me thank here uh, Nir Bitansky, who walked me through explaining to me their paper uh, really nicely. So, uh, uh, so it's his kind of motivation and a... Uh, hey, uh, and explanation. Okay, so how do you go from FE to IO? So it's really the idea is GGM. What we need to do is kind of recycle randomness, exactly as was done in GGM, and their construction is very similar. So here's how, here's uh, in a nutshell, here is their IO construction. So their obfuscation actually uh, consists of you first encrypt, you have a functional encryption, I'm going to construct an IO. So the IO first consists of encryption of the circuit you want to obfuscate, but then, and more things, and some function keys. So let me tell you what these function keys are. They consider this tree where each node of the tree is labeled by an encryption, a function like the encryption of the functional encryption of the circuit C and some prefixes inputs, X1 up to XI. And this prefix depends kind of on the path. So, and the children of this node are gonna be, again, the prefix with the zero and the prefix with one. So kind of the prefix grows, grows, grows until you get to the leaf and each leaf is labeled by encryption of, X, of C and an input, X1 up to Xn. Suppose the circuit you want to obfuscate has N bits. Okay, so this is the tree. Now, what are the, what are the function keys that uh, we give? So, each function key, we give essentially n function keys, kind of one function for, for each uh, layer of, of this uh, exponential size a tree. And the function, what it does is given C and the prefix, it computes the encryption of, of the children. It essentially computes the label of the children. So the encryption of C x1 up to xi was zero and the encryption of x1 up to xi with one. That's essentially uh, the idea. And, and so given these function keys, you can compute essentially all the labels in the tree. So you can in particular compute any label and any label of the leaf. 
And what they also gave the secret key for the universal circuit, that input C and X output C of X. So that's how you get everything. So that's the high level idea. Of course, uh, one needs to be very careful. For example, this function outputs a ciphertext, so there's randomness going on, so they need to deal with the randomness and so on and so forth, but this is pretty kind of use, uh, standard. Uh, the one thing that's important is that the for this construction, not to blow up, you know, for the, you wanna make sure that the, you know, the uh, ciphertext at the top are not huge. That's why you need to ensure that the length of a ciphertext does not grow with M, with the output of the function, which is now two ciphertexts. And you wanna make sure the runtime also doesn't explode. Otherwise your obfuscated circuit will run in exponential time. So one needs to be careful when implementing it. And that's why they need kind of the succinctness of the FE, that the runtime and the output length doesn't grow with the output of the function. Okay, but that's kind of the general idea, which it's really nice. And it's really got kind of based on the GGM uh, idea. Okay, uh, later, soon after, uh, yes, Vinny. So if you get a minor uh, compression, like M over polylog M or something like this, well, what, what do you get? Do you get something? Uh, no, I think, um, uh, well, you won't get, uh, like, you may get something, but I mean, the obfuscation will be too big, whether it's going to be, uh, no, I don't think you, I think if you get M over, Let's see one second. Uh, no, never mind. If it's not, I'm not yeah, I, I think I think uh, at, things will blow up too fast and probably be exponential, is my guess. But I didn't actually check. One needs to do, you know, uh, to check the calculations. Uh, I don't know I, if we know. I think the... I, sorry to interrupt. I think that even if it's one bit smaller, what you could do is make it output one cipher text and output one extra bit of the next cipher text. I think even one bit smaller would be good. Again, sorry, you're saying if you have one bit smaller, oh, you, you won't output two, you'll just output one. I will one, output one yeah. ciphertext and one bit of something, another ciphertext, and I can collect one mm, bit I along see. the way. In. I see, I see, I see, I see. So you just make it more complex. Yeah. Nice. Okay, nice, nice. Okay, very nice. Uh, okay, good. Uh, thanks. Uh, great. Okay, so that, for that, you need uh, succinctness. Uh, but then it was shown that actually, Semi-succinctness is enough if you also have LWE. So let me tell you what semi-succinctness is. So remember with succinctness, we said we need the runtime and the output length to be smaller than M. Semi-succinctness said, oh, forget about runtime. All we care is about the length. So the encryption can run in time M or poly M, but the output needs to be uh, smaller than M. Okay. So, okay. so that's, that's what semi-succinctness is. So in some sense, uh, the way to think about it is succinctness requires that the ciphertexts are short and the encryption is fast. Both of them are smaller than M. Whereas semi-succinctness says the ciphertext is short, but the encryption can be long. Okay. A, so how do they get that? Uh, the way they go, so they essentially show, use a func uh, short but slow functional encryption to get short and fast functional encryption. And the way they do that is essentially they use the GKPVZ result, which gives you, as I said, a functional encryption, which is not succinct and not, so it's the, both the runtime and the output length are proportional to M. And I, essentially, if you plug that instead, so the main idea is essentially, you know, they give you, you have a slow encryption, you need a fast encryption. How do you get a fast encryption? Well, you use the encryption of the GKPVZ, a, you see my mouse, by the way, hovering? Or no? Yes, okay, great. So uh, you use, instead of using the slow encryption, you use the encryption uh, uh, from uh, GKPVZ uh, to compute the slow encryption for you. And the point is that the output here to compute the slow encryption, the slow encryption is actually short. So the output length is small because you're computing a short encryption. So the basic idea is just a composition. They take their short and slow encryption, compose it with GKPVZ, and they get the succinctness. So that's basically it. So, okay, so now semi-succinctness is enough. That's great. The next observation, actually all you need is semi-succinctness for NC0. 
you don't need to consider anything else. Why is density zero enough? This should again immediately ring a bell. Well, we have randomized encodings that show that actually, you know, you can, uh, you can convert any function to one in NC0 by considering the randomized encoding of this function, which is essentially how they, get, how they show that uh, FE for NC0 suffices. So all these kind of things are using things that we already knew, you know, it's very kind of uh, uh, basic in some sense. Okay, so NC0 is all we need, great. And then uh, Lin, Passet, and Telang show that actually uh, they formalized it in a different way of XIO. So let me tell you what an XIO is because I think it's very interesting. XIO really kind of captures the fact that forget about FE with encryption, decryption, forget about all that. Really all you need is compression. And this was formalized really nicely in this XIO. So what does the XIO say? It says, look, all we need is an IO for a circuit that takes only polynomially in, uh, many inputs. Forget about this exponential many inputs and so on. It takes n inputs, like one to n, where think of n as polynomial. And all you want is the size of the obfuscated circuit to not just be the truth table, to be slightly better than truth table. So of course you can output the truth table, that's a good obfuscation, uh, but uh, that's you know, very non-succinct. As long as you can get an obfuscation of size n to the one minus epsilon, you're good. And moreover, this IO can be generated in a long time, poly n. So the time to generate it doesn't need to be succinct. You can actually run the C for all the inputs and so on, no succinctness there, just succinctness of the kind of representation. So this really captures kind of the intuition that I said before that I, to get IO really what you need is succinctness, that's all. And to see why XIO implies this semi-succinct FE, uh, this is actually, you don't need density zero here, it just applies uh, uh, semi-succinct FE, again, goes through the GKPVZ result. And the idea is to say the following, look, we already have FE, but it's not succinct. Okay, the, uh, the FE of GKPVZ has encryption length n. We need encryption length, the semi succinctness says that we need encryption length of n to the one minus epsilon. So really what we need to do here is compress the encryption a little bit. How do we compress the encryption a little bit? Oh, XIO. This is exactly what XIO does. It compresses a little bit. So essentially the way they construct their, their actually the uh, semi succinct FE is their new encryption is not the encryption the exact encryption of GKPVZ, but actually they, their encryption is XIO that outputs the encryption of JKPVZ, which I denote by encryption LWE because the GKPVZ is based on LWE. So again, the way they get show that XIO so, uh, implies FE is by using the GKPVZ result. So this is remarkable that all we need is, you know, tiny bit of compression. And finally, in this year, there's been a really amazing uh, line of work, started with Barkelsky, Dotlin, Gargan, Malavolta in their first paper, and then uh, after that, uh, following by Gay, Pass, and Wien Wicks, and also by Barkelsky, Tal, who later improved as well. And they showed essentially that all we need is what, what originally was called split FHE, uh, uh, but what now I, I, I think of it more as a functional encoding, that's I think the term from we and Wix, uh, but essentially what they say is, forget about the exact definition of functional encoding, but here's essentially, let me kind of tell you how they propose to construct XIO. They say, you know what, the way I'm gonna construct XIO is I'm gonna give some encoding of the circuit, that's the functional encoding. So this is an encoding of the circuit with some randomness. This encoding should hide the circuit. And I'm gonna give you this hint that will allow you to compute the circuit on C1 up to Cn. Uh, and this hint depends on the randomness and is succinct. Okay, so the hint should be of length uh, n to the one minus epsilon. So this is kind of the idea of functional encoding. You encode the circuit and you give a hint related to the randomness that allows you to do the computation uh, in a way that reveals C1 up to Cn and nothing more. Okay. So 
uh, and their main observation, to, I mean, their observation to, so they construct this functional encryption, but their main observation that allowed them to construct this functional encryption was the realization that actually all they need is to construct this functional encryption in the CRS model, where the CRS can be big, it can be as big as N. And the reason that you can construct a CR, that you can use a CRS is because, okay, just put a CRS on everything. Go all the way up with the CRS. And IO with the CRS is just, essentially at some point, the, the CRS is small enough, it's just, and it, it goes away. So uh, I, it can be part of the IO at some point. Okay, so that's kind of, uh, uh, of course there were many more in the way of reductions and so on. There was some reduction to secret key FE. And so I'm not kind of, as I said, it's not a survey. I'm kind of uh, giving the results that I think are, are, are necessary to see the progression that we're gonna see in this workshop. And indeed, what we're going to see that Jaylene Sahai, as I said, will show how to construct uh, a semi-succinct FE for NC0. And the results we're going to see tomorrow are going to construct uh, this functional encodings, which will imply IO. Yeah, Eli, can I ask okay. you a couple of questions on your side? Of course, yes. Back a minute. Um, well, like you, didn't, you didn't talk about the pseudorandom generator for NC0. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Oh, okay. And another thing is that you, when you say sub-exponential here, what does that refer to? In the XIO that refers to the compression? What, what I'll tell you, mean? yeah, so let me tell you where the, the X sub, actually the sub-exponential uh, comes from uh, the, sorry, uh, comes from the work of, of uh, you know, the, for FE here you need sub-exponential. Uh, hmm. And therefore kind of the sub-exponential kind of triggers down. Uh, and the reason you need sub-exponential is if you remember, there's kind of this gigantic circuit, the, there's this tree. And um, in the reduction, when you do the reduction, you need to pay with this kind of size of the tree, essentially. Uh, so, so you can only break something that has that. Yeah, the, the time to break essentially requires going over kind of a tree. So I don't have a better explanation. I don't know if anybody in the audience here uh, has one, but essentially that's how I think of it. Uh, yeah, I, just I a think... hybrid argument with ex an exponential number of steps. Yeah. So the probability needs to be sub-exponential to make that work. Right, I, I just want to add that it's different from the setting the GGM for PRF because in PRF the adversary engages in an interactive game where the adversary submits the inputs they wants to get the PRF output for. So in some sense, then the proof can focus on those polynomially many inputs when you do the reduction and hence polynomial, then do the hybrid for only polynomial number of inputs. But I know there is no interactive games that you just give the entire Fasky the program to the adversary, and you have no idea that what inputs this person is going to evaluate on. So hence, we just hybrid over all possible inputs. Got it. So it's, it's not necessarily inherent, but it's inherent with these type of techniques. It's inherent with the technique, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, it feels a bit more inherent than that, but I don't have more to say about it. I guess I'll add that the, for several applications, you can avoid that. So sometimes yeah. you don't have to do exponentially many hybrids for the specific Yeah, uh, thanks Sanjum, that's a good point. Uh, so you know, there's all these results that say IO implies this and I imply that. Many times just succinct FE already imply and you don't need the sub you don't need the sub exponentially there if you go just directly. So I uh, think that's a, a good point. Okay, so in the last two minutes I have left, I want to focus a little bit, um, and this Shafi goes to the PRG, uh, to talk about how we use, how we get uh, obfuscation, IO, uh, how we get essentially this functional encryption for NC0, because there's a line of work. It's not, uh, you know, JLS is not the first one. There's been uh, a lot of work in this uh, direction, and I want to kind of just f uh, summarize uh, where, uh, what this work is. So remember, we need to get semi succinct FE for NC0. And here's the idea. The original idea actually started from uh, JVW, Gobonovic, Kitonatan, and we, and then used in GKPPZ, uh, that shows that actually show it's enough to construct functional encryption for the decryption uh, 
uh, circuit. So let me explain. Here's the functional encryption. The functional encryption, you, how do you encrypt X? You give an FHG of X and you give one function key. The function key, essentially, if you want to uh, allow to compute X and input C, what you do is you give a function that depends on C and the decryption of the FHG. Essentially, this function, what it does, it publicly computes C on the encrypted X and then secretly kind of decrypts the outcome. And, uh, and what was noticed actually before even, sorry, uh, what was the, the point of uh, GVW, they said, actually all we care about is the degree of the secret decryption. The public part, the fact that you, you, know, you need to do to compute C and the FHE of X, we don't, the, the, we don't need to keep that secret. That's public, it's, they call it uh, partially hiding, uh, I think it was then predicate encryption of the uh, tier was actually way before the predicate encryption. But essentially, all we care about is the degree of the decryption. Moreover, what they noticed in 2015, actually, the degree is almost linear. What is it? What, how do you decrypt? It's essentially inner product with the secret key, and you get the, a noisy output. That's amazing. So it's not, not a high degree linear for you. Wonderful. The problem is that the, you get a noisy output, but this noise is sensitive. You can't just output the noisy output because this noise is a function of the randomness used to encrypt X. And if you reveal this randomness, things are broken. So this noise needs to be hidden. You can't just output it. And that's where the problem begins. Okay, so in this line of work, so actually in GKPVZ, the way we did it is we got rid of the noise by kind of rounding it away using garbled circuit. But then we didn't get succinctness. So the idea here in order to get succinctness was that they said, smudge the noise. And the idea of smudging, I think, dates originally to actually Gentry it's in, uh, in his thesis, but maybe even before uh, in one of his papers. Um, so uh, here's what the idea. The idea, encrypt not only X, but randomness. And this randomness is going to be used to kind of smudge the secret noise. So when you output, you don't just output the output with the secret noise, but you output the output with the secret noise, but smudged with this random noise. And, you know, it will statistically hide the secret noise. So, and it was used already in the context of obfuscation by Agroel Rosen in follow-up works. Okay, so great. So, so let's smudge the noise. Great. What is the problem? The problem that this smudge noise R is too long. We won't get succinctness anymore. It's good, it works, but it's not going to be succinct because the noise is that length of the output, which is exactly what we're trying to shrink. So it won't give you succinctness. So here comes the PRG, use a PRG. Great, great idea. We have PRGs, but we need degree two. The reason we need degree two, we can have high degree, but then you'll be Multilinear maps. If you want to use bilinear maps, you need degree two. Okay, and that's a problem. We don't have degree two. And then there's been a bunch of attempts <clears throat> to construct, well, we know we can't construct degree two PRGs, but some pseudorandom objects. And these have been broken and fixed. And that's kind of the third generation of the uh, you know, construction that we mentioned in the beginning. A, Actually, I want to mention, interestingly, they were broken via sum of squares algorithm, which is kind of uh, interesting, uh, interesting connection there. Uh, and so the new idea in the breakthrough result of JLS that you'll see today is how to construct this PRG, not quite degree two, rather what they call degree 2.5, but essentially sufficient to base it on bilinear from LPN, learning parity with noise. Uh, with some uh, regime of parameters that they'll explain, and PRGs in NC0. So that's kind of, uh, I think the focus of the J JLS is on this, the, on this PRG. So uh, this is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful line of work. Let me just summarize, because I'm out of time. Uh, so we saw this progression. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, we'll see today the JLS construction based on well-founded assumption. Tomorrow we'll see the construction based on uh, functional encodings. Uh, one thing I want to say, that these results are still kind of have this uh, a circular security a type definition which, or, or assumption, which is not standard yet, or is not standard period for us. Uh, 
But I think these ideas are in their infancy and they're very interesting. And, uh, you know, it's a very exciting prog progress that may lead to actually IO under LWE. So these results rely on lattices. They don't use any bilinear, any mappings at all. So, you know, they may be quantum secure, for example, and may lead to interesting follow-ups. So I just want to end by congratulating all the amazing people who had wonderful, wonderful results. And moreover, congratulate the entire community uh, for, for kind of stepping in and achieving this. I think it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey and a very exciting one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Questions? Or maybe I should thank stop sharing. Thank you, Yael. This, this was really an amazing talk. Thank you. And, and um, you managed to compress. Uh, in the spirit of compression, you managed to uh, compress <laughs> dozens of papers into a very uh, an, an excellent uh, observation, an, an excellent overview. And um, yes, we'll, uh, in, in, uh, people can feel free to ask questions. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to. Uh, I'll, I'll try to troubleshoot my internet, and in uh, four minutes, uh, Amit will start. Okay. Um, okay, so could I go for an informal question sure. at this time? Sure. sure. So that, that, that doesn't seem uh, like uh, an easy journey at all. And I could <laughs> even say that only from your facial expressions. That was really energetic. So I've been wondering, how do you know you are not wasting your time when you are working on an unwell-established approach. Good, I have- uh, An I, approach which seems risky. So I, I wanna say something about that. That's a great question. How do you know that you're not wasting your time if you don't get the results you want? And I'll tell you what I feel like is what's not waste of time. So first, if you feel like you're making progress in your understanding, that's not waste of time. Even if you didn't get any the, to where you want your end goal, it's not a waste of time, okay? You understand more, that's very valuable. Moreover, if you have a good idea, even if it doesn't work, a good idea is valuable. And it's, it, we saw this here over and over again. There were great ideas that were broken. They were still extremely valuable. So as long as you feel like your understanding is improving and new ideas are coming, whether they work or don't work, it's valuable. Because at the end, you know, pieces come together. That's my, my opinion, but I'm happy to let others uh, inject their own opinions. I have a technical question and then maybe a remark on that. But yeah. uh, Hotek, in the Q&A, you said uh, regarding exponential loss, another way to look at it is that the reduction must know why C0, C1 are functionally equivalent, which seems to require going over all the two to the n inputs. So I guess my question here is, why does the reduction have to know that? And second of all, um, in that case, it, should, it wouldn't be sub-exponential, it would be Exponential, so. So uh, it, it won't be exponential because you can play with the, with the security parameter. So you go over all the inputs, n, two to the n, but you make the security parameter n to the thousand and then it be, or n to the one for epsilon. So it becomes a sub-exponential, not, not exponential. And why do they have, why do we have to check that they're function equivalent? If I break something at the end, I break it, why? Sorry, so I didn't, let me read, I didn't read the. Uh, Maybe I can just say something that, that you know, the, IO only requires security and we can only hope for security when the circuits are functionally equivalent, right? And okay. so, that, yeah, so okay. that, that must be used somewhere in the argument, right? The point is that in your security proof, you better be using that C0 and C1 are equivalent. Otherwise your proof can't possibly work because you're proving too much. But the reduction is that if somebody, so there is an obfuscation, okay? Let's say you, you claim that you have a construction and it works when the circuits are equivalent Then somebody comes along and he breaks it. Uh, I mean, and uh, that, and that will break whatever no, it's, it's, a, it's yeah. actually a really great question that you're asking because this has been an intuition that me and Sanjam and many, many people yeah. throughout the community and, and I think what that can like have discussed and yet we've never been able to exactly formalize it because of this issue. So at least as far as I know, 
no one has been able to completely formalize this need for um, for an ex for uh, you know an exponential number of steps in the in the in the in the, uh, yeah, in the so it's more like a moral argument as opposed to a real argument. The question is how would it work? You know, like how could it? How could you make use of a breaker if you don't even know why the circuits are equivalent? It's just more of like a moral argument that I don't know how to write that down. How do you make it actually break something? Moral but Shafi, Shafi's question, I think, well, can I think be answered. A very slippery. Shafi, if you, if you can give two circuits that are not equivalent, then it's very easy to distinguish their obfuscation, right? You just, um, you just no. query on the point where they're not equal, well, right? So this is why you have to use it. But why do you have to verify that they're both, that they are? Um, okay. Yeah, I think what, what Shafi thinks, the reduction can be not universal like that. The reduction can know that they're the same somehow, right? Uh, and therefore, like, it seems the intuition is like, if you have like this meta reduction that works but maybe you can have a proof that doesn't use that. So it's not so, clear. so I'll say a little more. I, I think, you know, Yael and others also, we try to formalize this together and we, we failed. But, uh, but like the intuition is that the reduction should work if the circuits are equivalent and it should not work if they're not equivalent because then it's trivial for an adversary to distinguish. So yeah. somehow the, the reduction works in one case, but not in the other case. It seems like it should be distinguishing the two cases. Um, but again, it's not, you know, we can't prove it formally. It's very tantalizing because I think okay. you have to. <laughs> okay. And I just wanted to say something about that question about how do you, why do you keep working on something that seems like uh, a waste of time? I think most of these results, almost all of them, in addition to trying to do what Yale pointed out, they also did something else. So maybe they, 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 they uh, obfuscation was the ultimate goal, but they actually had a side result. So to be, and it's nice to say that having an observation is good enough, but unfortunately, program committees don't think this way. So, so, and and you know, it's, I, especially as a young person, to keep on working on something that nobody actually um, seems to give you credit for is not is not advisable <laughs> uh, in some sense. So, so, but there, I think that all of these results have had side results. So, it's, even though there is sort of this pie in the sky, there was also intermediate results. And, and those were worthwhile on their own. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, I think this is actually a good point. Maybe this is uh, also a, a good point in general in favor of uh, uh, incremental results. And, um, and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's sometimes easy to somehow say, why are we working on this problem, which, uh, you know, tries to, uh, here is this uh, thing that we knew how to do with, uh, I mean, a lot of works in theory, right? Uh, we, we take this thing where the, we knew how to do it with M squared and we change it into M. And uh, it's very easy to dismiss these kind of things and say uh, these are incremental, but these are actually important. We will not be, the, if we said that uh, we only accept a paper and people would uh, themselves say, we, I'm only going to work on a paper if it solves the mega problem and if it's not, doesn't solve it, then uh, it doesn't matter. Then we would never discover all of these techniques and uh, we would never get it. So uh, maybe it's important when we evaluate, uh, when, when we evaluate papers to also remember that, uh, you know, if a paper does a, uh, has a result, that's a minimum. It definitely achieves that. Uh, there, there is no upper bound to what these techniques could be used later on. Uh, the, so we, we shouldn't say, oh, okay, if the paper proved the result and that result by itself is not the great uh, grand thing, then uh, yeah, we should reject it. <laughs> Another way to think about it is that we're all algorithms people, right? Even though we call ourselves cryptographers, what we construct are constructions for algorithm and reductions, which are algorithms. The point is that the reduction is valuable even if the assumption is false because the reduction is still an algorithm that has some new insight in it. And in many of the, the previous uh, papers that did not have side results that were really just going straight for IO where we had other assumptions, the reduction was the important point, right? That the algorithm that was underlying the reduction and the algorithm that was underlying the construction was where there was new insight. And I think that's uh, another thing that I definitely think um, <laughs> program committee should look at is the, you know, the novel the, the insight that's being added by the actual algorithm. And we're all algorithm people. Okay, so I think uh, I, I'm, really, I'm really liking the discussion. And uh, I, as I guess, as a warning, uh, as, as you can already see, 
we might uh, not always be, we, we will try to uh, approximate the time schedule with, uh, within an additive factor of uh, five minutes or so, but uh, we, we, I'd rather have a great discussion than uh, be, you know, completely sticking to the schedule. And uh, so, so I would like to continue have this, uh, <coughs> Uh, interruptions, discussions, etc. Because uh, yeah, we could all watch a recording of the videos if if it wasn't for that. So, uh, but with that, let uh, let's start uh, the the three part uh, uh, sequence of one line of these works by.